I would like to personally welcome you to Faith and Hope for Today. We are here to bring you the clear word of God to strengthen your faith in the challenging time we live. We know that your faith produces hope and that God will take you through anything. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember you are near. The pace of life just gets so out of hand. I'm reminded of how much I need to know You are for me Well, it's great to be back in your home again this week. Uh, we have a really uh, an amazing presentation, I hope, that challenges you, that uh, pushes you to go back and study the Word. Uh, I hope you notice that in our series that we are really about presenting the Word of God, trying to make certain that we are careful with the Word, that we say what it says and that we're not adding something to it, so I really hope that you are blessed with these presentations on the apocalypse. This is a significant and important conversation. I also want to take a moment, and uh, Sherry has a series of bird pictures. This is from our backyard. Uh, this lovely, uh, this is a snowstorm. There's little snowflakes in the uh, area behind that little bird, and it's just watching Sherry as she shoots away. And uh, they'd come to the bird feeder and have a great time. So I want to thank Sherry for just sharing that beautiful creature with us for a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you, Sherry. All right, so let's jump into our discussion. We're in Matthew 24. This is part four of a series. The title is To Be Ready. So in Faith and Hope for Today, we find joy in bringing you the Word of God that it may enrich your life, that it may be the fullest life it could possibly be. So, it says in John 10.10, 10, quoting Jesus, they came, I'm sorry, I came, that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, to have that life, he gave us the ability to say yes. It, it is a gift. And in Romans 12, 3, it reads, as God has allotted to each one a measure of faith. In other words, every man, woman, and child on this planet has a measure of faith, the ability to respond affirmatively to the invitation and the purposes of God. And I find that to be quite amazing. Every single human on the planet has that gift given to them. So, now, as we look at Christ's purpose and what God revealed about his will, let's jump into our study. We live in such an odd time with the internet, for example. We have access to millions of half-truths. In other words, you can go through and look at, uh, uh, for hours, and just excavate and dig out half of a truth on almost anything in the world. I think that we're in a period of time where most of our personal truths are often a collection of others because there is now so much information out there. And we just sort of take in bits and pieces. And I just, I just suspect from my conversations with folks that truth is changing in so many dynamic ways. But notice that Jesus came to set us free from partial truths. This is John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. So Jesus brings us wholeness in our spiritual life, but he brings us also the wholeness of truth about God. We don't get a partial truth from Jesus. We get the whole truth. And what difference does that make? Well, I think it makes absolutely a huge difference in your everyday life. How you impact others, 
how you understand your own nature, Jesus has opened clearly a way for you to embrace the truth and live life more abundantly. Now, Jesus also wants you to be informed and knowledgeable about what it is he is doing. Notice it says in John 13, verse 9. Now, I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. In other words, Jesus has given us a revelation of what is to come. That's what's so important about the prophets in the Old Testament. The book of Daniel, for example, is very relevant to today's life. The book of Revelation. God, and, and he has gone to great lengths to make sure that we know what is coming so that we are not easily deceived or that we buy into partial spiritual truths. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in, have, of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only, the Father alone. In other words, Jesus said, that day in which I return belongs entirely, completely to the Father. Now, we can rest in these words. It's up to the Father to determine the day and the time. We can speculate that that is all it is. However, Jesus tells us enough to know it is coming. If you and I are studying, if we are paying attention. Verse 37 of Matthew 24 reads this way. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Just like should cause us to pause because the days of Noah were the last days of the antediluvian society. It was the days just before the flood in which that violence was taken and removed from the earth at that time. I'm going to take you on a little journey here to help you understand what it was like in the days of Noah. In Genesis 6:11, it says, now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. Now pay attention to these words, because Jesus says that these words are describing what it is going to look like just before he returns. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. So now we know when we talk about the days of Noah that that violence, that corruption, is what we are witnessing again today, just before he returns. And folks, the world is changing rapidly. I do not need to give you the details. You see it. You know it in your heart. Notice Matthew 24, verse 8. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. Now, I want to say this to you. It's really important. I've had people say, well, we should never get married because the end is about to come. And they look at this verse. And I'm saying that verse does not say that. It just simply says they were preoccupied with everyday life, paying no attention to all the things Noah had warned the earth about. Remember how many got on the boat? Or maybe you should remember how many did not get on the boat? Because they were totally preoccupied with themselves and their world, as it was in the days of Noah. Selfishness and preoccupa preoccupation with themselves. Now, Matthew 24, verse 39 says this, And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Are you hearing what Jesus is saying? That most of the world is paying no attention. You see, it was the antediluvian's choice not to understand. Noah preached. Noah invited. Noah pleaded called on every single one to get on board of the ark to repent and change from their ways, but to no avail because they were satisfied 
and self-gratifying that in everything that they did, becoming in Scripture more violent in that selfishness every day. Now, I'm going to talk about verses 40 and 41 before I introduce them to you. But they have been a point of confusion and misunderstanding for years. That does not have to be so. What is said before is when Christ returns, it will be like lightning illuminating everyone and everything visible to every human eye. There's nothing secret. There's nothing hidden about Christ's return. You cannot make the Bible say that it was somehow some secret coming. It just isn't there without twisting and distorting the word of God itself. So here's verse 40 and 41. It says, when Christ returns, there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. In other words, not everybody's going to go. In verse 41, it says, two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. That word taken means to be taken into, like taken into the presence of the returning Christ. The other one left, having been judged to remain, they have rejected eternity. Which of those would you prefer to be? The one taken or the one left? It is so vitally important that we understand that what Jesus is trying to say to his disciples, and we know there's at least four of them listening here in this conversation. He's trying to explain that not everybody's going to want to go to heaven. Not everyone's paying attention. Not everybody is responding to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. As sad as that is, I want you to notice what Jesus is saying. Not everybody wants to go. And I want you to pay attention. Not everyone wants to go. Because they're satisfied with the limited life they have here today. That is the nature of selfishness. In verse 42 it says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. In other words, the emphasis here is to be ready for Jesus' coming. The message is to be watching, to be alert, to be involved in being ready so as to not miss eternity. The passage cannot be made to say or imply something is secret. It only says every eye and every person will see and know that he has come. And if we know that it's not secret, then we know that when he comes, he redeems his church. The question for you and me isn't complicated here. The question is, do we know and do we understand what it means to be ready? Are you ready? Do you want to be ready? Are you intentional? Are you involved in saying, Lord, I am anticipating the joy of that day that you come and receive your church unto yourself? Matthew 24, verse 43. Jesus' words again. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Simple story. On the ranch... Uh, that we had in eastern Washington. We had sheep and cows and ducks and, and there were, I had six siblings and we had all that acreage to go out and enjoy. My dad had a 300-gallon fuel tank sitting down just over the edge of the hill there, uh, probably a couple hundred feet from the house, maybe 250 or so. And he would have that filled with fuel. And periodically he would go down and all of a sudden that tank would be almost empty. And he realized that some of the boys out there and some of them other ranches could sneak up that hill, help themselves to fuel. So my dad, being aware that this was happening, would then set up and, and try to make certain 
that no one was breaking in and taking that fuel. That's what Jesus is saying here. If you knew the time, you would be on alert. The question is, if violence and corruption are the signs, at least part of them, are you intentionally being in a mindset to being ready? Verse 44. For this reason you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. The fact that so many do not think he is coming is the greatest evidence he is coming soon. The distractions of this world has preoccupied the human mind and people are oblivious. So we have violence, we have corruption, and then we have, well, some people don't even think Jesus is going to come back to this earth. They think this is all they have. Isn't that fascinating? Here's one of the most important signs that Jesus may be about to come any time now. What does it mean to be ready? This is a huge question, but it is not complicated. I'm going to try to just share with you some simple verses. Maybe you will want to write these down. This is what Paul wrote. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what Paul is saying is that he realizes that Christ took Paul into himself at the cross of Calvary. And that he has surrendered his life, turned it over to Christ, and now he lives a life in Christ, through Christ, by Christ, with Christ, every day of his life. He said, I call that living by faith in the Son of God, who loves me, who gave himself up for me, isn't that profoundly simple? He just simply says, I've given my life over. I have been united in Christ's death. And now I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's profoundly simple theology. Notice Romans 1, 16 and 17. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also the Gentile or the Greek. For in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, from faith to greater faith, you could say, as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. My working def definition of faith is simply an affirmative yes to God's purposes for your life. A yes is an action a active response to God. Matthew 24, verse 45. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Now, Jesus is talking specifically here now to those in charge of the church. Pay attention to what he says. I don't think you ever want to miss this. When he said, give them their food at the proper time, do you remember what he said? He said, feed my sheep to Peter. Jesus was going to challenge ministers. Here it is food to be ready and waiting for the coming of Jesus. His challenge to ministers was, are you feeding the people to be ready when I return? That is the context of Matthew 24. Give them their food, their spiritual preparation at the proper time. He writes in verse 46, Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. So Jesus is appealing to those called to proclaim the gospel. They are challenged to encourage and teach Get ready and be ready to live by faith in the Son of God so that 
you will be taken into Christ. Now, folks, that's not terribly complicated, is it? You know, I, I've heard so many evangelists properly say this. Do you know it's so easy to be saved and so difficult to be lost? If, if being saved by faith is an affirmative response, yes, to God, yes, I want Jesus to come into our, to my life, then you realize how difficult it is to just constantly reject Christ because he loves you and gave his life for you. He desires that you come and spend eternity with him. Notice verse 47. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. That is the faithful servant of Christ. I understand God's purpose for you is to have an abundant life and to share in eternity with him. Verse 48 reads this. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards. And we're going to pause here. This is a serious warning to those who are called to be servants of Christ and him crucified. He's saying, do not abuse your authority or your congregations. I mean, we can hardly go a month without a, a church, a mega church or mega pastors who are caught, who are just going down in flames, who are abusing, using spiritual abuse in their congregations, just simply violating Christian principles. We're, we're reading what Jesus has said to the servants. Just because he isn't coming, he said, don't, don't go out and abuse I want to address the issue of spiritual abuse. I cannot tell you how serious and how damaging spiritual abuse is in the Christian church by any servant in any position in the church. The scars run so deep. If you look at France, if you look at Russia in the Bolshevik Revolution and the French Revolution, what you realize it was spiritual abuse who produced atheism, a complete rejection of God in the church. And it did not have to be that way because here Jesus is making a call to those in charge of his church to be kind and gracious and redemptive, not to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards. Do not abuse your congregation. Do not abuse with your authority anyone in your congregation. Isn't that fascinating that Jesus took time to address this very issue, knowing exactly what the condition of the modern church would be today? In other words, what we realize is that the word of God is timeless in so many ways. So if you're an elder, if you're a deacon, if you serve teaching a class, whatever it is you do in the church as a servant of Christ. Allow Christ to dwell in your heart and manifest his love and agape compassion towards another human being. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour which he does not know. That's an incredibly sad story to those called to care for the church. An incredibly sad story. That those spiritual leaders who abuse others, who neglect their responsibility, are going to be caught off guard. Fascinating, isn't it? Verse 51, and it says, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites in that place where there be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Now, that doesn't sound like a great place you'd want to be, does it? But that, that is how remorse 
is described in scripture. In this story, for the servants who abuse, who use spiritual authority to abuse others, they are going to experience remorse rather than joy. So how is it with you? If Matthew 24 is a call to be ready and waiting for Christ to come and redeem his people from this earth to eternity, then Jesus calls us to choose him. Jesus has done all of the saving. Which of the following do you think you would be? Just process this moment. If Jesus came tomorrow, Would you experience remorse rather than joy? Or would you experience joy rather than remorse? Who are you in this story? Is the most important question we can ask you today. Jesus is coming whether any of us are ready or not. The question is what will we experience? Jesus calls us to say yes to his perfect work of redemption, to accept the invitation to experience Christ in you, the hope of glory. The one question each of us every day has the privilege and the joy to answer is this. Will you say yes to Jesus today? And again, will you say it again tomorrow morning? Will you say it again tomorrow afternoon? Will you keep yourself in a connected, ongoing conversation so that you never have to experience remorse on that glorious day that Jesus comes to redeem his people? God's purpose for your life is to have life and have it more abundantly. He has done all of the saving if you will reach out today and just say yes and accept it. It's his gift to you. The gospel is so positive, so profound. It is the simplest and most wonderful, best news in the whole world. I brought back a picture for you, another one. Sherry has shot a sequence of this lovely morning dove sitting out here on the post. and Now we get to come in a little closer today and it's just sitting there, just warm and comfortable, enjoying the snow. I want to thank Sherry for that picture. Thank you for listening. Thank you for saying yes today. I hope you have a really rich, full week. Thank you for watching today. Our email address is screamingrockministries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho, 83303.